survival of both farmland uh, and larger uh, global existence. Okay, when we look at livestock production, are we talking about CAFOs or are we talking about pasture? And the last picture was cows and sorry, cows and this is poultry. And both of those shots are of farms that participate at green market. We more and more we, we see these weird indoor labs that are that are popping up and and I consider these to be that to be industrial agriculture. And this is Lonnie's farm that is extending their season and producing their Persian cu cucumbers. All right, we're talking about so soil based urban agriculture. We're talking about rooftop urban agriculture and both have their pluses and uh, and, and their challenges and also what how you answer that defines who has access to it and what it's being grown for and what the costs are. When we look at processing, this is Stephanie Villani. She's one of, um, she, she actually, her, her boat no longer sells at Green Market, but for 20 plus years, she actually met her husband at Green Market. And this is her in her backyard smoking bluefish. This is a, it's, right? These are folks that are, it's a larger scale processor where asparagus is being canned. And then of course, who knows what this is? And you can shout out. This is pink slime. It's pink slime. It's industrial waste, basically, that's used in our food. That's right. So big picture, right? And the, 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 the ag census comes out every five years. So, and it actually is released two years after the year that it's capturing. So in 2019, the 2017 ag census came out. And just to let you know, the, the USDA defines a, officially defines a farm as any place from which $1,000 or more of agricultural products were produced and sold during a census year. So in 2017, there were 2.04 million farms in the US. That was a reduction, a loss of about 90,000 farms from 2012. It was a 3.2% reduction in the number of farms. We saw a loss of about 1.6% in total acres, so about 900 million acres. Oops, I missed, I missed a, a, a digit there. Um, and and the, yet the average farm size increased that 1.6%. 97% were what are identified at the USDA as family owned operations, of course, Everyone has a different definition of what family means, but let's just say that they were not corporate controlled. The overwhelming majority of farms in the United States, 88% are small farms with less than $350,000 in gross farm income. And these, these are some of the numbers that, that I, I want you to pay attention to. And this slide and the next slide I, I actually, if I were teaching a course, and, and when, I, when I did teach a, a course, I started every class with these two slides because everything that I wanted to talk about, I wanted to reflect back on, on these numbers. Mid-size and large farms account for 9% of total farms in the United States. Only 3% are corporate owned. The small farms, 88% of the farms that were taught that, that in, the, in the US, own about 48% of all farmland and 47% of the value of farm real estate. And yet they only account for 20% of total sales. And this number, this next number is even is more striking and only 5% of farm profits. So 9% oh, so of farms basically account for 95% of farm profitability in the United States. And that's why we exist. Who controls our food supply? The four largest pork packers, beef packers, soybean crushers, and wet corn processors control between 71 to 86% of the supply chain. Four companies control over 90% of the global grain trade. 
And these businesses, they control everything that goes into a, the product getting from farm to market. Far, on, on large scale in, 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 industrial agriculture, the farmer is basically an indentured servant. And through vertical, it, it, the companies control from the prices of fertilizer and feed to the tractors, to the distribution. And the result we saw, we're losing farmland, we're losing farmers. And in 1950, farmers took home 41 cents of every dollar. And today it's less than 15 cents. And we're gonna, we'll, we'll get to this. And while at the same time, companies like General Mills are making 2 billion in profit, ConAgra made almost 8 billion in profit. And JBS, it's a, a pork packer um, or meat uh, company, did 51 billion in gross sales and Cargill, 114 billion in gross sales. This is who controls our food supply. <clears throat> and tell you that <clears throat> our food system is not broken. It's working exactly as it was designed to work. Okay, it doesn't mean that it's fair. It doesn't mean that it's just, uh, it just mean, it doesn't mean that it promotes health, whether it's community health, environmental health, or physical health, or economic health. It is designed to produce a lot of food cheaply and for those profits to go into a small group of individuals pockets so um sorry for the my god it's my wife's phone across the room i can't even get to it um so again going back 80 percent of food sales generated by the large farms which only represents about eight percent of farms in the u.s we look at the, the size of farms 50% of lettuce farms are bigger than 1,373 football fields combined. And for tomato production, it's 620 football fields. And if we were gonna talk about food waste today, I could show you how many tons of tomatoes are actually thrown away every hour on these large farms. But the, the, the US government and big ag and universities that promote big ag would tell you that industrial agriculture is feeding America and that from an environmental perspective, this is a good thing, right? Because we now need less acres and less animals to produce as much food to feed a growing population than we did 50 years ago or 70, 70 years ago, right? Today, 29 million beef would have, we, we, we would have the amount of beef that's produced through those beef would have almost needed to be doubled, but because of steroids and growth hormone, we're able to produce a lot more meat on the animals, on the individual animals. And for dairy, it's, it's nearly, what, four and a half times less animals. Corn and soy production, which is, which is grown to feed these animals, uh, requires significantly less acreage, which means that's a lot, of, that's a lot less fertilizer and runoff and pesticides and manure, right? And it, so, like I said, it reduces water and fertilizer use. And these, these big businesses, and I, as I pointed back before, just like the small organic farms are using low-till cropping systems and cover crops, but rather than the way the smaller regenerative farm does it, where they're either harvesting those cover crops, or at the end of the, at the beginning of the season, they're turning those cover crops into soil to be used as, as green manure. Industrial agriculture, because the crops that they're growing are GMO and have a gene within each plant that are resistant to the, the Roundup, to the, to the sprays, they can spray over everything and their cash crops will remain healthy and they kill off all the cover crops and the things that actually could be used to promote greater soil health. And like they, like uh, I said, they're, they're using half the labor, 16% less of the land. And from 1940 to 1980, the number of farms fell by half and the average farm size tripled. Well, we know that there are significant costs to this. And that actually the industrial food system 
is destroying our environment. Can anyone tell me what, what this is? Shout out. Um, oxygen levels um, in certain parts of the where I'm saying, I would say like next to Louisiana and Texas, which is about the um, like the northern, the northern east, you know, but like it's mostly like oxygen. It's about oxygen and how it's messing with the ecosystem with the plants being around and how it's messing up only parts of of the um united states but not everything i feel like it's gonna it's gonna grow that's 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 exactly right this is a dead zone in the gulf of mexico the size of massachusetts where nothing can live because of runoff from industrial agriculture right we see algal blooms more and more each year This, it, the way that CAFO produced meat, these are, this is a chicken farm in North Carolina. So the, what the, the manure is collected, it's liquefied. And of course, on a good day, uh, the, the tanks don't break or, or leak into, into the groundwater and evaporate too much. But the way they are fundamentally, uh, the, the way the fertilizer is dis dispersed is it's broken down and liquefied and then spread over fields. There's drift throughout the region onto neighbors' properties. And what, one of the things that we know happens in North Carolina, unfortunately, year after year, are hurricanes. And so when there's a hurricane in North Carolina, that farm looks like that. And you would think we would learn from our past behavior. Uh, you got to go. Yeah, okay. That's a, that's a child. Um, we'd learn, think that we would learn from past mistakes and that maybe this is actually destructive and that we're spreading disease and bacteria throughout the region when a hurricane hits. But this was in uh, 2012 and that was in 2017. We're not learning from our mistakes. And of course, if we, we've seen deforestation throughout the country and throughout the, the world for crop production. Going back to that first slide, uh, or, or that's the slides that I wanted to go back to about who controls our food system. You know, the, I'm gonna scroll back up for a second. To tout, a, that it's a good thing that agriculture is using half the half the labor and half the land. Well, that means directly, right, that farm communities and people's lives and people's livelihood have been destroyed along with those numbers, right? When you have unprofitable farms and the, the majority of which are struggling to, to compete, and when you see the reduction in farmland, that is the reduction of people's lives, of, of communities. And you'll see here that in the early 1900s, there were over 6 million farms in the US, and now there are just over 2 million, right? 84% of small farms depend on outside employment for the majority of their household income. And 30, this is, this is a stat that, that, again, that streams out to me. Almost 40% of farms, the farmer, his or her or they self, have a primary occupation that is not farming. So they farm in the morning, they go off to work, and they come back and, and continue to farm. And then that's how almost 40% of small farmers are making a living. And this is a, a the, the sort of the, the Thanksgiving meal. And you can see what the farmer's share is of each product. When you look at the dinner roll, like four cents. When a, a retailer is making 3.29, the farmer that grew the wheat takes four cents home. 
of every dollar. 65 cents to the, for the guy who's raising the, the pork that's going into the ham. These are, this is real. And over the, the past decade, and this is probably even earlier, over the past, past 20 years, the cost of food is getting higher and higher, and yet the farmer's share remains stagnant. And when you talk about issues of race and, and equity, these numbers are even more striking. In the 45 years following the Civil War, former slaves and their descendants accumulated 15 million acres of land across the US, predominantly in the South. In the, in the 1920, there were 925 black owned farms, about 14% of the total uh, US farm population. 1975, by 1975, there were 45,000 black owned farms and now they're even less. Today, 2% of farms and 1% of total rural land is black owned. You look at farm workers in, in this country. The official number is 48% and advocates will tell you that it's closer to 70% of US farm workers are not here or are unauthorized to work in the United States. Of that number, and this is not relevant to agriculture, but relevant to who we're talking, people that we're talking about, 65% of them are parents, have families. Officially, 73% of our farm workers are immigrants. Of that, 95% come from Mexico, another 3% come from Central America, and another the other 2% come from all, all over. I, I know that at Green Market, some of our uh, farmers have uh, farm workers from Egypt and from Jamaica, uh, but the overwhelming majority are, are here coming from Mexico. I wasn't sure if I was gonna keep this slide in, um, but we know how important regenerative agriculture is and, and organic matter. And, and soil is the second largest pool of, of carbon and how we think about soil and how we take care of soil. You know, we, for years, we've talked about it as <clears throat> good agricultural practices for crop yields, for water and soil retention, for drought and flood resiliency. But really how we think about soil now in terms of, the, of climate change, building soil carbon is crucial to planetary, for our survival as a planet. <clears throat> Excuse me. So th this concept of sustainability, We've always, you know, for years we've talked about it from an environmental standpoint. But I, uh, the definition of sustainability that I love to refer to, and I did not create it, uh, a group of researchers from Johns Hopkins created this definition. A sustainable food system, I'm going to read it. Uh, it may be a little boring, but I'm, I'm going to, I think it's, it's good to hear. Sustainable food system is one that provides available, accessible, acceptable, and adequate food without impinging on the rights of future generations to have the same. This means adopting an ecological agricultural system that is self-renewing through the proper stewardship of soil, water, and plant varieties, and the use of practices such as rotational cropping, integrated pest management, low-till or no-till planting, and careful management of the farm to fork value chain to reduce waste. At a food system level, this means supporting policies that enable rural farming communities to prosper, in poorer communities in cities, and, and I would say, and in rural communities, to have access to markets providing healthy, nutritious food, some of which may be produced by urban and peri-urban agriculture. <clears throat> so this definition, I think, is what defines our work collectively, what all of us on this Zoom set out to do every day uh, when we go to markets, when we go to our farm stands, our food boxes, and when we advocate and agitate for what the type of food system we want to see. Right? Michael, yep. I want to invite Jennifer to, to share her question because I think it's, it's imperative and it's really great. Thanks. Just trying to get my everything back up. Um, I had a question. So, Michael, you were talking about um, two sort of separate things earlier. You were talking about how GMO practices 
they tend to rely on the sprays, uh, Roundup Ready crops and so forth and, and that to remove any cover vegetation, whereas smaller farms tend to, or non-GM farms tend to turn that back into the soil as a green manure. No. And I was wondering when you got to the part about um, soil as a potential carbon sink or carbon pool, if the GM practices and the big ag practices then tend to reduce the soil as a, as a carbon trap, like if those two practices make a difference in that. It, it, it's, a, it's a huge difference. Um, a, a, a good example is Ken Miglarelli is a farmer at Green Market who, you know, I, I hate using the term conventional, but the, the, the guy grows probably 300 varieties of, of, of products that is, I call him diversified local, but would use, would use chemicals. When he start, when he learned about grains through our, our grain program, he started planting grains and it increased his organic matter in his soil by 2%. And that's a huge number. And so, yes, when you are using sprays to, to kill off your cover crops, it's not as bad as using the sprays without the cover crops, but you're still destroying micronutrients in your, in your soil. And you're not building that same level of organic matter in the soil. than if you're turning over the products, uh, turning over the, the cover crops directly in it. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, so again, we can produce enough food globally, if not for logistics, politics, allocation of resources, and economic barriers to an adequate distribution system. Again, all that we are trying to address with wholesale, with our infrastructure, with our, with our markets, with, T, with, the, with our, our training programs and technical assistance. Accessibility, I'll, I'll go through these and we, we can share the, we'll share the presentation at the end and, and I know that, it, that it's recorded. Um, talk about big picture in New York. And this is kind of, it's, it, I got these numbers from the Farm Bureau who are our friends and partners, but we're talking about big ag here for, for the most part. Right? There are 35,500 farms in New York state, same definition of family owned. Um, about 25% of the state's total land area is farmland, which is about 7.3 million acres. And you can see the average farm size is half that of the US. And that alone defines the type of agriculture and profitability that we can have in New York State and our ability to compete nationally with big farms in the Midwest and California. And that doesn't even talk about the, how other, the other expenses uh, in New York State that, are, that make it significantly more challenging to grow here in the, in the Northeast than, than, than nationally. We're a total of about 5 billion in farm sales in 2016. Dairy is the largest portion. And I would say that the farm diversity and crop diversity is mostly in part from the small farmers rather than, than the big farmers. We grow a lot of, lot of food here. And, and we are the top 10 in a, in a number of products. Uh, first in low fat cottage cheese, cream cottage cheese, sour cream and yogurt, go figure. Um, a lot of apples, a lot of beans, a lot of syrup. Um, and uh, you can see the, the, the cheese, the tart cherries, and, and, and the caps. So that's the big picture New York. For Green Market, we have any, on any given year between 200 and 240 producers that represent on average about 32,000 acres of farmland. 70% of our farmers come from New York State and Orange County is actually the, the largest cluster of farmers that are selling at our market. We also have farmers that come from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, and some of our boats that catch fish dock in Rhode Island. The average size farm is about 82 acres and the median size farm is about 125 acres. There are over 12,000 individual varieties of products represented at Green Market. Uh, through, in any, any year, we talk about biodiversity and, and, and crop diversity. 
between 10 to 15 percent of our farms are certified organic. I, I use this slide to demonstrate a, a few things. The guy on the left is Ron Benaghi Jr. The guy on the right is Ron Benaghi III. This is the closest farm to New York City. It's Bergen County, New Jersey. It's one of the only, I think, one of three farms left in Bergen County. The land value is probably 10 to $15 million. But Ron keeps it in agriculture because he knows that he has a viable living selling what he grows there at his farm stand and at two markets in New York City. Ron was there on day one, uh, July 16th, 15th, 1976, Second Avenue and um, 59th Street in a, in a parking lot that, that no longer exists. And for the, the previous year, our two founders of Green Market, Bob Lewis and Barry Benepe were driving around trying to convince farmers to come in and, and sell into the city. There was this, we, we were losing, I think we lost about 450,000 acres of regional farmland in the decade between 1965 and 1975. And they saw that, that it was an environmental disaster pending with that loss of farmland and it being developed. And also regardless of income level and, and, and community, there was no access to good food in the city. So Ron came in with 11 other farmers and was sold out by 11 o'clock. And that was the birth of Green Market. And his son, Ron the third, uh, third farm generation farmer on that piece of land, dropped out of his music program in Rutgers after his sophomore year and said, I want to farm. And I believe that there's a future in agriculture because I can sell, come into the city and sell at Tucker Square. And that's what he does. This slide I could talk about for the next 10 hours on so many levels. And Jennifer, I'm going to talk a little bit, tie this a little bit to your question. Um, this is Stanley Osipinski, and this is the black dirt region of Orange County in New York. It's the second largest glacial deposit only to the Everglades. And if it was farmed properly, it could produce a significant amount of food for New York City. And it does, but it could do a lot more. Um, Stanley's family, like many Polish immigrants and German immigrants that settled in Orange County, grew onions, just monocropped onions, fields and fields and fields of them. And in the early 70s, the onion market bottomed out. And these guys didn't know what they were going to do. And Bob Lewis told Stanley, why don't you load up a pickup truck with your garden's vegetables? I think his garden was about three acres, maybe six acres. Uh, and he came in and um, he came in and, and again, and sold out just like Ron did that day. He's been, now has three kids on, on farm and grows over 350 varieties of products. Uh, you know, he's at, I think six markets, including uh, our market on 175th Street and Broadway in Washington Heights, which is our second longest market, uh, which was started in 1977, only to Union Square. Anyone who wants to see what a thriving market looks like in a lower income community where Spanish is majority spoken language and dispel the myth, go to 175th Street on, on Thursday and, and you'll see it. Go to Poe Park today. Um, anyway, tell you a story about Stanley. Stanley's politics may be a little bit right of, of Attila the Hun, but we're not going to judge him for it today. Um, and when we were in an FCAC meeting, and he talked about green manure, our mouths probably, uh, you could see our, our jaws drop because this guy's been a sprayer and we, we know him as a sprayer, but he understands how expensive it is to buy those chemicals. And he also has customers throughout the five, four boroughs who say, we don't wanna buy food that has that many, many chemicals on it. So he started cover cropping and turning that under into his soil. And he reckon, and, and this is, you know, this is a region that was devastated by Hurricane Irene, that it, there is such a water density that he understands how important organic matter is in his soil for both the drought, but also for the, for, for flooding. So Stanley uses, uh, uses green manure. 
our farmers come from all over the world. Over 50% of our farm businesses are owned by women. The diversity of cultures in the Northeast sell at market. And if it can be tapped, pastured, or made into cheese, it's represented at market. This is considered Bardwell Farm. Early on, they asked if they could partner with a neighbor called Jersey Girl Farm about 20 miles away. And Jersey Girl Farm was a single operator, a young person who just could not survive selling this, the most gorgeous milk to the wholesale market. I think she got paid 14 or $15 per hundred weight, and it just was not covering the cost of production. But because Consider Bardwell was turning that into a value added product, bringing it into market, bringing it into the city, they could help Jersey Girl manage their herd, think through issues of insemination and of uh, genealogy and helped with the processing. And it ended up being able to, to average out for her to have $20 per hundred weight. And that difference of six to five to six dollars per hundred weight kept these two farms in production. Our fishing communities, our small boats, <clears throat> face the same challenges as our farming communities. And fishing is agriculture, right? Through consolidation and through uh, competition with big boats and international boats these communities are being decimated as well. And so being able to sell the freshest fish in New York City directly to the consumer is what keeps these boats at thriving. And again, this is vital economy for their, for their neighbors and for, and for their regions. In the big picture, about 85% of our farms would say that they would be out of business if they had to rely on strictly wholesale channels and couldn't sell directly to consumers talking about issues of equity and going back to farm workers, right? In 2001, we created the new farmer development program and that was strictly working for the first, I think 13 years. We worked strictly with immigrant farmers who brought robust agriculture knowledge from their home countries, but didn't know how to adapt it here. And so they would go through a financial literacy course it would, it would be the, the recipe was technical assistance, access to markets, access to capital, access to land. And uh, in 2014, we expanded it to really work with any city based grower that wanted to scale up with an emphasis on communities that had been traditionally left out in agriculture BIPOC farmers, LGBTQ farmers, women, veterans, people coming out of who were formerly incarcerated. And since 2001, over, there have been over 400 graduates of the Farm Beginnings Whole Farm Planning, who received roughly 30,000 acre hours of language appropriate, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance in areas of land access, access to capital, access to markets, and legal support. 97 new biz farm businesses have been created. Over $250,000 has been distributed through 0% interest loans the 97% uh, repayment rate and 23 green markets are attended by program graduates, predominantly actually in low income neighborhoods where our graduates have a disproportionate impact on food insecurity throughout the city. So what that means is that even though the, the graduates of this program represent total farm ownership, and I'm talking about just fruit and vegetable growers, by the way, they have about 1% ownership, equivalent of ownership of the total acreage represented in, at Green Market. It, the, the farmers take home between, I think 20 and 30% of SNAP dollars, health bucks and farmers market nutrition program because they are serving their communities. Uh, they're a culturally appropriate food. And that's not to say that Sergio in Alaska is not selling high-end mescaline mix in Inwood, uh, right? but it means that there is epizote and papalo and papiche and dozens of other varieties that net did not exist in New York City prior to 2003, let's say that's now being sold because of, of this program. 
Um, in all, we, we worked with uh, Colorado State and Cornell University to look at the impact. And, you know, it, out of the 240, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a small sample. But if you look um, about uh, the, the average farm sales at Green Market are about 430,000. The, the better number is, is the median. So 50% of farms that sell through Green Market earn above 143,000 and 50% earn less. On average, over 50% of our farm, our, our, our vendors are profitable and have increased the number of employees and gross sales. This was done in, in 2004. But again, if you look at that first number where oh, nearly probably 90% of farms, small farms, or actually 90, we said 95% of small farms are not, are not taking home net profits. Over 50% of our farmers are. That doesn't, we, we, that's not good enough for us. We want that number to get higher. But we have farmers whose partners or spouses are working off farm. They have their own other jobs in, in, in the winter, um, but they are able to be, have viable small farm businesses. And Unlike our industrial system, which is an extractive system, the green market farmers are contributing between 143 and $565 million of economic output and employ. The number that I, would, that I use is about 2,200. Our, our farmers collectively employ 2,200 far, individuals. That is resiliency, that is, that, that is a regional agriculture economy. For every dollar of sales that's generated, 61 cents of additional economic activity are contributing to the regional economy. And this, this slide here they, they put together shows how many individual touches we have with partner our partner organizations here in the city and rurally through the work that we do. So I'll wrap it up now. This is Union Square at 5.30 in the morning, sort of the calm before the storm. Um, and really, you know, Tyler's going to talk to you next week. Our models, whether it's green, whether it's retail, farm stand, food box, or wholesale, are all designed to, to fulfill a two-part mission, which is farmer viability and equitable access to what's grown regionally. And I'm incredibly proud of the work that we collectively do. We make a, a have a huge impact on farmer lives and on communities here in the, in the city. Um, and let's open it up. I think we have about 11 minutes left and just either for conversation or for questions or whatever people want to do. Thank you, Michael. That was incredible. Um, I have a question. I'm, you talked about the Black Dart region and we often talk about how it's 85% fertile. I think I just didn't realize that they needed um, to add fertilizer to their soil. Well, I don't know if that's just me being a, a topic for this for, for discussion. Um, you know, there are, there are some organic, there's a, there's a huge amount of weed control issues. Um, you go to the Chester Ag pro, uh, project and you can see these are small organic farms that are just battling uh, the, 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 the weeds because of how productive it is. You don't need to use fertilizer in, in the black dirt. And um, it's really between the way things are being produced or overproduced uh, or not being or rotation not being practiced or because there have been years and years of spraying, it's almost it's killed the organic matter that they need to revive some of the soil. Thanks. I believe um, Isabel and Gabrielle might have had their hands up. Isabel, are you able to unmute? Um, hi, I was just applauding, but um, <laughs> um, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, let me think of a few questions, but um, anyone who has one right away can go first. No worries, my bad, thank you. And Gabrielle was also clapping. But um, anyone who has questions, feel free to unmute and, and, and ask, or if you have just a thought or a response. I have another one. Please. Um, and you did touch on this after you had mentioned it initially, Michael, was um, 
over the years, how much influence have you seen? Um, uh, and, and I, as you said, there is a lot of it influence on the farmers with what is being asked for at market, but I'm interested with a greater discussion centering around um, ecological practices, sustainability, any influence that interaction with people at the market and what customers are asking for has had on, or potentially any on farmers who are perhaps adjusting their practices or had an interesting conversation with a woman on Saturday. And, and I was like, well, just ask, ask the farmers what they're doing because we lost one of our only organic um, producers. And she said, well, they're just going to lie to me. And I'm like, I don't think they'll lie to you. They might hedge, but I don't, I don't think they're going to outrightly lie to you about what their practices are, but I'm, I'm just interested. Um, if any, I see from the face that maybe not so much. <laughs> no, no, no. I didn't put a slide in here that I was thinking about. 76% of our farmers have taken a growing practice, they've changed something that they've done within a year of a customer asking them to do it. So that was one of the things that, that was studied. And, and I, that's what I talked about with, with Stanley in terms of, of, of the fertilizer, but in terms of growing practices. We have chefs that develop relationships with farmers and they bring back seeds specifically for those farmers to grow it for them. Um, you need to tell your, the customers to go talk to those farmers. A great job, that's what you should be doing. And if someone says, oh, they're gonna lie, you can say, listen, they actually can't lie because they sign a contract that if they misrepresent, then there's gonna be a consequence for that and not like, there's this great threat hanging over their head because people want to engage. I mean, we have conventional growers who lo love the opportunity to explain, particular orchards, why they spray, what they spray, how they spray, when they spray, why it's safe, or why they think it's safe. And those are great conversation builders. So that, that's what we want happening at market. The other thing is, we just finished a, a grant with uh, the Doris Duke Foundation. And we surveyed customers, I don't know, there may have been folks on, on this call that did some of the, the dot surveys, but we surveyed customers around the role that climate change plays in their purchasing and how they purchase. And also farmers, how climate, how one, how climate change impacts their growing practices or how they could be incentivized to use different growing practices to meet the new challenges that climate change presents. So we, um, we can share the results of that with anybody. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, Michael, do you see that question in the chat? What are the benefits of rooftop or urban farming? Um, so I, I'm, I'm a biased individual, so I, I, from a policy perspective, don't think that rooftop farming, you know what, this is a, this is a big, it's a, it's a more complex answer for me to start that way. There are a lot of benefits to rooftop farming, depending on who's, who's producing it, how it's being produced, and who has access to the food, right? Let's go back to my big three. So... We grow in YC, our sister program, Gerard and Mike work with afforded, affordable development, development uh, developers and they build farms on, on roofs and have a two year contract to train the residents how to take care and maintain that garden. We've actually had food box sites at some of these locations where the food box is being supplemented with what's being grown on the roof. That's phenomenal, right? Um, and that's just one example of what can be done really well on a roof. Some of the big operations and commercial operations that are out there, it's who's growing it. It's venture capital backed operations, right? Who has access to it? They're mostly growing high-end greens. So it's not that interesting. It's not solving a problem, but it is employing people. And so if they're paying them properly, that's a good thing. And if it's not, being zone like if it's not being taken away from, from other folks or the city's not investing money into it and it's all through the other capital. Okay. But I know that Gotham Greens works with NYSERDA, which is a state agency, and they study water usage. 
And so if they're disseminating that information to the larger ag community, that's a good thing. I'm not going to hate on them. Um, I don't love it. Like that's not what I would uh, pro you know, propose to be the end all and, and the solution for feeding or for urban or urban uh, agriculture, but it certainly has some benefits as long as we're not subsidizing. Any other questions for Michael? Um, I have like, um, I just want to like throw out a thought kind of, um, but first of all, I want to say like, thank you so much for your presentation because it was super informative and it, it really opened my eyes to kind of like the inequalities and like the system, um, just the food system and agriculture, like it, it really, really opened my eyes. Um, I wanted to kind of touch upon what we, what like we were talking about like two comments ago with kind of like the, um, the customers being kind of cynical of, of the farmers. Um, and I feel like it's something that I noticed like working at the youth markets. Um, many of them um, kind of are almost like antagonistic. Like the farmers are trying to like rip them off or like the prices might be too high. Um, and just from this presentation, like um, I feel like it's, it's misguided cynicism, but it's understandable. Um, because these demographics are like the customers come from demographics that don't have like a lot of resources. And so I, I understand like how difficult it is, but I feel like just from this presentation, like we should be like directing like kind of like, like this anger and cynicism towards like big agriculture instead of like the local farmers. Um, because if, if I understand correctly, it's really like the big agriculture that's making it difficult for these local smaller farmers to compete. Um, and just to supply um, these customers with the higher, which the ultimately higher quality and healthier produce. Um, so that's something like that I was thinking about as I, as I um, went through this presentation. I mean, and you couldn't have said it any better on, on all, first on all of it. First of all, thank you uh, for the compliment. Um, but we subsidize big agriculture, right? We pay for health costs. We pay for environmental cleanups, and we literally are subsidizing directly sugar companies and corn production and soy production. We are making cheaper food available to people so that like, there is no reason, and I, I, I steal this quote from Marcel, our, our big boss, that a potato should cost more money than a potato chip. A potato chip comes in a bag, it's been processed by people, it's gone through a distributor and yet it's cheaper than buying the potato itself. There's something very wrong about that, right? And when you think about it, yeah, it may, it's gonna make me very cynical and, and angry and I wanna channel my energy. But that's why you're gonna be, you're a great ambassador and educator. You are a community educator at, at, at your market. That is a fundamental role of, of what, you do, what you do there. And I'll make you a bet that if you went to three of the, the, the closest places where people buy four of the products that you're selling, the price, your price isn't that much more money and it's significantly better and it will last a lot longer. But thank you, that's fantastic. Great. Um, I just wanna note that it's, it's 7 p.m. I am going to give room and space for one more question, if there is one. If not, we can. Can I, can I say one last thing? Of course. Thank you again for, for the opportunity. Good luck, all of you. Thank you, all of you. Um, I'm around for a few more weeks, but I am a resource forever. So use me however I can be helpful. Um, and I look forward to seeing everybody at market, at food, at, at the farm stand, um, or at a food box site, or in a park, or hanging out. Great. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, and I, I also want to, I want to tie in a theme that I kept hearing when you were talking about the different farmers and um, their experience of what it meant to them to be able to come to the green market and to be able to like 
sustain their livelihood and how the green market basically was a lifeline. Um, it ties into something we we're talking about when we, we talked about food systems. And um, I think sometimes when you talk about the, the state of, our, of the agriculture, of, of the environment, of climate change, of oxygen, the atmosphere, basically everything that's going around, um, it is it can feel very disparaging and it can feel very discouraging. But something that I remember we talked about when we talked about our local food system, and I also kind of want to reiterate here, is that we have the ability to make small and lasting changes. Like Michael was saying, if customers did not come to the green market, the farmers wouldn't be able to, to sustain their farms. And as they sustain their farms, then they continue to like engage in these sustainable practices that help to, um, to sustain the land for agriculture, but also for future generations. And so I think we all are poised in, in really significant spaces to have conversations with people, to talk to them about what effect their patronage of all our different food access programs has, not just on the farmers, but also in the future and specifically on the Northeast, right? So I'm, I'm hoping we walk away with um, some encouragement that it is not all doom and gloom, that we have the ability to make small and lasting changes, but also some really big changes. Um, I, I think I typed in okra over in the chat and remembering a story of how you couldn't find okra in the green market like five years ago and and that oh five or ten years ago and this is just something that has changed because of like customer influence and customer questions and so um i think sometimes in life we forget how much like one person can actually change the world or just change the way that systems exist um so yeah i want us to like leverage our power and use that to to host some really engaging conversations yeah, and also my last thought. Uh, I know sometimes, you know, you're busy at the market and sometimes people will come by and ask questions and they're going to ask, is this organic? And you don't have time to go into uh, a really in-depth conversation with them and it can feel frustrating because they're not listening or uh, they want something in particular that we are not offering. But I think even if we reach that one person, uh, I, I just make sure, just know that you're you're making a, a difference. So we don't have to reach everybody, uh, but if we do reach that fewer folks, we're good to go. Uh, also, I just threw in a link to the evaluation. This is specifically for farm stand youth. We just want to um, one know how the the how the workshops are going. Um, if you are not a, uh, a youth but want to respond to the evaluation, feel free to do so. But uh, specifically for the youth, please fill that out. Cheryl, I don't know if you have any closing words before we leave. No, okay. I thought this was great, and and thank you all for asking such um, you know such great questions. It's always helpful to hear um, hear your thoughts. And sorry, it's loud in here. <laughs> and and thanks, Michael. It was, it was great to see this. Yeah. Cool. All right, y'all. Have a enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much for coming and keep an eye out for our next workshop. Yeah, thanks all. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Michael. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Okay.